Today uh, we will talk about uh, capital structure theory. And we've, before I start, I will show you the same thing again. What is the objective of the uh, firm? It is to maximize shareholder value. And for that, we talked about capital budgeting decision last time, very briefly. Today, uh, I will start talking about financing decision. And in the financing decision, do you remember what we're doing? We're trying to find money for taking projects. Because in this part, we know which projects to take. Now we need capital source um, to take the, those projects. So we will try to find optimal capital structure, if there is one. Um, and this optimal capital structure should, should maximize the, the firm value. So we will see whether we will be able to do that. And when I say optimal capital structure, I'm talking about optimal mix of equity and debt. When I say equity, I'm talking about issuing stocks. And debt, we talk about debt before. It can be public debt, like bonds, or it can be private debt, like bank loans. Okay? And um, in this sense, we will try to find the right kind of equity and right kind of debt to issue. Okay, this is another thing you remember from Tuesday. Uh, what is the value of the firm? The value of the firm is the summation of debt and equity. So we have some part of equity and some part of debt, or just vice versa. So what we will try to do is we will try to maximize this pie, the, the value of the firm, as much as possible. And we will try to increase the size of the, the pie, because this is how you increase the value. Um, and when I say capital structure, Again, we're talking about how to finance the projects, where the money comes from. It can be in the form of uh, debt. It can be in the form of common stock or preferred stock. There was one more source that companies use for financing. Do you remember what it was? The biggest source, actually. It's not debt or equity. It was something else. Which is internal funds. Exactly. 80% of the money comes from internal funds. And if the, the uh, money the company has is not enough to cover the, the cost of the projects the company wants to undertake, then the company will be in financial deficit. In this case, companies will use debt or stock. Do you remember which was more common? It was, was it stock or debt? debt. It, was, it was debt, right? Perfect. So the question we're going to ask to ourselves all the time is, does capital structure really matter? And some people say, yes, it matters. Why? Uh, do you remember the advantages of that? We talk about a few things. One was cost of debt is lower than cost of equity. Do you remember that uh, graph? I have it somewhere. I will show it again. Uh, cost of equity is really high, cost of issuing equity, compared to cost of debt. And there was the tax advantage. Do you remember the tax advantage of debt, wh where it comes from? Let's remember income statement, where basically it was revenue minus cost minus depreciation. So this was EBIT. And from EBIT, we reduce what? Interest. So we end up with taxable income. And from tax taxable income, you pay tax to the government, and you end up with net income. So if you have debt, you will have interest payments, which will reduce taxable income which will reduce the tax you pay to the government. So that's a tax advantage, for instance. So people focus on those advantages of debt, and they say, of course, using the right kind, kind of financing is important. But some people say, why does it matter? You're thinking about the same pie. You can slice the pie in four or in eight. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether the slices come from debt or equity. It's the same slice of cake people say. And the article that I assigned to you, uh, which was given uh, the talk by uh, Professor Miller, he says the same thing. I think a pizza delivery guy goes to Yogi, Yogi Bear, uh, and the Yogi Bear say, uh, the, the pizza delivery guy says, do you want four, sli uh, four slices or eight? Do you want me to slice the cake in four or eight? And Yogi Bear says, slice it in eight, I'm hungry. So it's the same pizza, okay? So this is what Modigliani and Miller will say, actually, and we're going to start talking about in like 10 minutes maximum. Okay, so 
Why are we spending two weeks on capital structure? Why are CEOs thinking about what kind of um, that or, uh, what, what kind of source they're going to use? Probably capital structure will matter. At least in real life, we're going to see it matters. So now let me show you a couple of very simple examples on how that can affect return to uh, shareholders. Remember, we're trying to maximize the value of the firm. So in this first case, um, here we have good performance of a company. I'm going to show you three different versions of this table. Let's try to understand this one well, and then we're going to move very quickly in the next two. So suppose that this uh, company has $10 worth of equity or $7.5 worth of equity or $5 worth of equity. So three different cases. And this company has some debt with 5% interest rate. So this is the interest rate on the debt. So the company can have zero debt, $2.5 worth of debt, or $5 worth of debt. In all cases, the, the asset value is the same, right? It is 10, it is 10, it is 10. The asset value doesn't change. So we, when we calculate debt to equity ratio, it's going to change, of course, because we're using more and more debt. So debt to equity ratio will be 0, which is 0 over 10. Or it will be 2.5 over 7.5, 0 0.33. Or it, it will be 5 over 5, which is 1. Clear? OK. If it's, I'm giving it to you. It, it comes from, um, I mean, it comes from the, 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 the um, sky, let's say. EBIT is $2 in each case, earnings before interest and taxes. Interest payment depends on how much debt you have. It's always 5% of what you have as debt. So 5% of 0 is 0. 5% of 2.5 is 0 0.125. 5% of 5 is 0 0.25. So these are the interest payments for the debt you have. So earnings before taxes, taxable income will be 2, 1.8 or 1.75. This is simple, right? Am I, is there any, anything that's not clear? No? OK. The tax rate in the, <coughs> in, in the economy is 40%. So 40% of 2 is 0 0.8. 40% of 1.8 is 0 0.75. 40% uh, of 175 is 0 0.7. So you end up with net income, and these are the net income in all those three cases, which is taxable income minus tax. Again, simple. So you end up with net income. And in each case, we're going to calculate return on equity. What is return on equity? Do you remember return on equity? Oh. Income over equity, right? Net income over equity. So this is 1.2 over 10. 12%. Uh, this is 1.125 over 7.5, 15%. 1 1.05 over 5, 21%. So as you can see, the more debt you use, you increase your return on equity, which is a good thing. So you see that when the company has good performance, this is the good performance case, because EBIT is $2. In the other cases, I'm going to reduce EBIT. Uh, when a company has good performance, increased leverage is a good thing. It increases return on equity. And you all see this, right? OK. The other examples, I will move fast, I promise. So in this case, I put average performance. Everything is the same. I'm just changing EBIT. So this time, instead of giving you $2 EBIT, I'm giving you $0.5 EBIT. In this case, again, I'm doing everything the same. I'm not going to go over them. And I calculate return on equity in each case. And it is 3%, 3%, 3%. So increasing debt had no effect on return on equity when you had average performance. What about the decimal law? Oh, it's, the, it's the same. It should be the same. OK. So good performance, leverage increases return on equity, average performance. Leverage doesn't affect return on equity. Let's look at the bad, uh, bad performance. In this case, I'm giving EBIT to be equal to 1, minus 1. So there's a loss for this company. Really bad performance. In this case, if you calculate return on equity, it's going to be 
minus 6%, minus 9%, minus 15%. So this time when you increase leverage, what happens to return on equity? Return on equity decreased. So when the company has bad performance, we see increasing leverage actually affects return on equity in a bad way. What is the bottom line? Leverage amplifies the effect of good or bad operating performance uh, on, on return on equity. That's why it's called leverage. So in good times, that makes everything better. In bad times, that makes everything worse. OK, let's look at another example if you don't have any questions. Yes, Alija. Yeah. <coughs> why uh, if we have negative income uh, earnings, why, why did we pay the tax? Why there is the tax? So there is negative earnings. OK. Minus one dollar, minus 1.25. But there is also tax. Why, why there are? Why are we paying taxes, even if we are? Actually, we are gaining the, the, the tax here. We are not paying because they are minus. Why there is a tax? OK, why is the case? OK, your homework is create the same table, OK? <laughs> but instead of using EBIT as minus, use it, use it as a positive thing. It can be 0 0.01, it doesn't matter. And try to create return on equities. And think that why taxes is negative here. Oh, one more thing. Last time, um, Bartu, Bartu, this R, R effect. Uh, you ask about each bank and whether they have different stocks. I couldn't find anything on it. So, again, your homework <laughs> will be to look for it. <laughs> huh? No, no, it's, I'm like, when I say homework, this is not, you don't even have to submit it, okay? It's just something that you can share with us. Remember, the purpose of this class is all learning together, okay? So, I look for, uh, Remember I said Google has different types of stocks, type A or type B, and it has different voting rights. Type A stocks has one vote right, or type B has like 10 vote rights. So, uh, but who says, I think each bank has uh, more than one type of stock. I look, I search for it, I couldn't find it. So if you can uh, look for it and share the information with us, I will re really appreciate that. Don't do it now, <laughs> though. <laughs> Don't do it during the class time, okay? Okay. Uh, I think in television there's a uh, teletex part. I think uh, here it has some uh, uh, different stocks. I look at balance sheet for the information. Yeah. I couldn't yeah, find it. Different because for the creator for the bank, like each group, each group is exclusively for the creator for the banks, but it's also traded in the market. Okay, just send me the link with it. Just okay. Yeah, I, mean, I trust you, but I mean. Academia, so we have to show everything with references. Even in every graph, you will see my references. I, I pay a lot of attention to that. OK, very good. So let's look at another example. So consider that we have an old equity firm. And this firm wants to have some kind of debt. Um, the firm borrows $8,000, which is debt, and buys back 160 shares at $50 per share. So they are repurchasing, repurchasing stocks, actually. So in the current form, the assets of the company is worth $20,000. The company doesn't have any debt. It's an old, old equity firm. Uh, so everything is in form of equity. Debt to equity ratio is zero, because that is zero. Interest rate is not applicable, because the company doesn't have any debt. Uh, shares outstanding, suppose that this company has 400 shares outstanding. This is the current case, no debt case. The share price is <laughs> given at 50. In the proposed, um, proposed project, let's say, the company will still have $20,000 worth of assets, but it will have $8,000 debt. This time, the remaining part will be equity, which will be $12,000. Uh, that equity ratio will be 8,000 over 12,000, which is 2 over 3. Interest rate is, is it given? Uh, it is 8% given. Shares outstanding. Uh, what's going to happen to shares outstanding? 
So we had 400 shares. We're going to buy back 160 of it. It's going to decrease, right? Huh? It, it's going to decrease to 240. And share price is supposed to at 50. OK? Forget about the market reaction, what's going to happen to stock price. We're going in very like, basic steps. OK? So in this case, let's look at what's going to happen to earnings per share and return on equity. So under the um, current structure, all equity case, we're going to look at three different forms of economy. We might have recession, we might have normal times, or we might have expansion. So EBIT will be 1,000, 2,000, or 3,000, depending on what, where we are in the economy. Uh, if in the current structure, we don't have any debt, so interest will be 0, 0, 0. So net income uh, will be 1,000, 2,000, or 3,000. So how do we calculate earnings per share? I put it in the slide. It says net income over shares outstanding. So we have 400 shares uh, in each case, and income changes in each case. So you can calculate return on equity. It's going to be 5%, 10%, and 15%. OK, so this is the current case. Let's look at what happens under proposed structure. In the proposed structure, EBIT will be the, the same in each case. I mean, in recession expected and expansion cases. Same with the current structure. But we're going to pay 8% interest on how much debt we have. Do you remember? 8000 8, Thank you. So we are paying 8% interest on $8,000 debt. So this is what's going to happen to our net income. OK. Again, you calculate earnings per share. But this time, numbers of shares outstanding is equal to 240. So you're dividing net income with 240 each case. This is what happens to your earnings per share. This is what happens to your return on equity. So if you compare return on equity with the previous case, in the previous case, it was 5, 10, wait, wait, 5, 10, and 15. So the current structure is good in which time? All, being all equity is good in which case? Recession, ex expected, or expansion case? In the recession. So if you're a risk-averse CEO, what are you going to go with? Are you going to go with the current structure, or are you going to have some debt? You're risk-averse. You're going to go with current structure, because, earnings, uh, because return on equity is better when you don't have any debt. When you look at expansion or ex uh, normal times case, though, leverage makes things better. So if you're less risk-averse or risk-neutral, then you would be OK with taking, off, uh, taking some debt. The same idea, the, the similar uh, intuition, just a more numeric, uh, numerical example, let's say. So basically, when we're thinking about debt, this is what we see. If you, have, uh, if you draw a graph with EBIT and with uh, earnings per share, with, uh, without any debt, this is what you're going to see with the numbers we just used. With, with that, we're going to have something like this. As you can see, we're going to have a steeper relationship between earnings per share and EBIT when, when you have some debt. And what this shows is you have some break-even even point on the left-hand side. Which one is better? Is, debt, is uh, having debt good or no debt good? Which one's? No debt case is better because you're having more earnings per share per, per EBIT, that, that's a good thing. After the break-even point, though, you have more advantage if you have some debt. Clear? I have only one minor question here. Why do you think this line is steeper when the company has some debt? It's not very easy to see, but think about it. So basically, this means as you increase EBIT, earnings per share will increase more if you have debt. Think about the example. What is earnings per share? Because of income. It is income over what? Shares. Numbers of shares. When you have that case in the proposed structure, do you have less or more shares outstanding? Less. less. That's, that's the case, right? So when EBIT increases, you're distributing it into less numbers of shares. So it, earnings per share will increase more. That's why it's steeper. 
I mean, in that case, because you buy back uh, sec securities. Okay, it was just a minor question. Now we can finally start capital structure theories. So I'm going to start with trade-off theory. We're not going to have time for pecking order or market timing. I'm going to actually cut kind of in the middle of Modigliani and Miller today. And next week, next Thursday, we're going to talk about pecking order and market timing. I will actually uh, I will upload another set of slides which will give you the evidence on capital structure theory, ther theories. So I will give you real life examples of everything we, we see next week, next Thursday, after finishing all the, all the theories. Okay, so again, what are we trying to do? We are trying to maximize the value of the firm. Do you remember this little guy from Tuesday? So the value of the firm depends on cash flows the company generates. And of course, since we are interested in the value of the firm today, we are discounting all those cash flows with the appropriate discount rate, which is weighted average cost of capital. Do you remember what weighted average cost of capital was? You don't have to give me the formula, just the idea. It is the hurdle rate that the company uh, accepts the projects over that rate. It's just like the cost of the company. It's, it's cost of financing. Right, exactly, Weight, weighted average cost of capital. And you will take projects if weighted average cost of capital is less than the return that project will generate to you. What kind of financing, what kind of cost we can have? What kind of financing can we have? So this is weighted average cost of capital. What is the weighted average part? Debt it's debt or equity. So we have cost of equity and cost of debt. So together, we're gonna solve examples on this today, so don't worry. Uh, so this is weighted average cost of capital, and this is the basic present value formula, if you remember. So you discount all those cash flows, you bring the values to today. And as I said last time, if your capital structure doesn't affect this part, what is the only way to maximize the value of the firm? to decrease weighted average cost of capital as much as possible, right? If you make this smaller, when this is fixed, you're gonna increase the value of the firm. So today, this is what we're gonna see. We're we are we gonna assume that capital structure doesn't affect cash flows, and we will try to see whether changing capital structure will really change weight, weighted average cost of capital. Okay, this is what we're gonna, we will try to do. So we said we are trying to Maximize firm value by minimizing WEC, assuming that we cannot affect cash flows. We know that that is cheaper than equity. There's tax advantages with it as well. But we also know that there's a problem with that. If you increase that a lot, you, ha you increase the, the, uh, the possibility of bankruptcy. So basically what we will try to do is choose the debt to, to equity ratio which will minimize weighted average cost of capital. It sounds very simple. It's of course not very easy in, in real life. And what we are um, we're gonna see is, we are actually, we will be aware that capital structure indeed affects the cash flows. So we cannot say ceteris paribus, as all econ people say all the time, and you know, like holding everything else constant, it's never constant. So this part will complicate everything. But in general, this is the picture we, we will have in our mind. So we know that cost of debt is lower than cost of equity. And we know that weighted average cost of capital is the weighted average of those two costs. So it has to lie in between. So what we will try to find is, if there is one, we will try to find this point which may, uh, the optimal debt to equity ratio, which will minimize weighted average cost of capital, which will maximize the firm value. So for this one, Modigliani and Miller came up with a very interesting theory. They actually got a Nobel Prize with it. And you know, this year, finance people got Nobel Prize. The I, probably like first time ever. <laughs> Generally, econ people take stuff. Um, and when the camera is off, I will give you like gossips about like uh, those people. Um, Modigliani Miller came up um, in 1956 with a new idea. So they, they said, forget about the traditional view. 
And they say capsule structure is irrelevant. Why are we spending time on it? It's irrelevant, they said. So this was pretty, break, uh, it was a big thing uh, at that time. But they made very, very simplifying assumptions. Like even in this stage, like as um, almost, I mean, as university students, I mean, you will be aware how basic those assumptions are. So they assume there are no taxes in the economy. They assume there's no bankruptcy. They assume there's no transaction cost, so you can easily uh, exchange stocks and debt and everything. And they assume financing doesn't impact operations. Very simplifying assumptions. And they actually prove those by arbitrage and low of one price. And I'm going to show you the proofs as well. It's not very complicated. Um, later on, Miller wrote another paper, and he relaxed uh, a couple of uh, assumptions. So he included taxes, for instance. But he concluded the same thing. He said capital structure is irrelevant. So today, I'm going to spend most of the class showing you capital structure is irrelevant. Then I'm going to relax some assumptions. And we're going to see how things will change when we relax assumptions. First, I'm going to introduce taxes. Then actually, I will stop. Next week, I'm going to introduce bankruptcy. And we will see how things will change. OK, so as a starter, the simplest world with no taxes, no bankruptcy. So in this world, we're going to assume there are two firms. They have the same operating cash flow. Uh, company U, it is unlevered, all equity firm. And company um, L, it has debt and equity both. So it's the levered firm. And we're going to assume that we're going to buy 10% of the unlevered firm and 10% of the levered firm. So my investment will be 10% of the unlevered firm. And from the investment, what am I going to make? I, my return will be 10% of the profit the company generates. Very simple case, OK? Forget about dividends and everything. In the other case, you're buying 10% of the levered firm. So when, since it is levered, you own 10% of the equity and 10% of the debt, because the company has bought. So in this case, you, have temp, you own 10% of the debt, 10% of the equity. So together, you own 10% of the entire firm, which is VL, levered firm. What is my return? As a debt holder, I'm going to get 10% of the interest payment. And I'm going to get 10% of what is left out after interest payment was done, profit minus interest. So total. 10% of the profit. So from here, if your return is same, you're getting 10% of profit in both cases. If there are two investments with the same return, what do you expect from the investment? Values? Should they, should they be the same, different? If you get same return from two investments, what does low of one price say? What does no arbitrage say? Huh? Thank you, Yeet. Yeet, right? Thank you. If there are two things with the same return, their prices should be the same, right? So in this case, 10% of VU will be equal to 10% of VL, right? Because they have the same return. We're assuming that capital structure doesn't affect profits. Those profits are the same. So what is the conclusion of the proof? VL should be equal to VU. So whether the company has debt or not, it's irrelevant. The value of a levered firm should be equal to value of the unlevered firm. If we assume that capital structure doesn't affect profits. This is Modiglia and Miller proposition one, actually. So can you understand what you read in the article now a little bit better? <laughs> OK, that's the idea. OK. Um, but remember, we are in the no bankruptcy, no tax case. In that case, the value of a levered firm should be equal to value of unlevered firm. Very important assumption is that um, 
For a very, very important assumption is that capital structure doesn't affect cash flows of the firm. That's our simplest uh, assumption. And firm value is determined entirely by the cash flows. That's it, not the capital structure. So no matter how that equity, uh, the, the ratio that, uh, of debt to equity you use, there is no optimal debt to equity ratio because no matter what you do, you cannot increase the value of the firm. So this is Modigliani Miller proposition one. You kept the structure is irrelevant. When we talk about um, when we when we think about that, if kept the structure is irrelevant, what kind of debt you're using is irrelevant? Long term, short term, senior, subordinated, whatever you can think of, it's all irrelevant. What kind of stock you're issuing is all irrelevant, common stock, preferred stock, type A, type B, it doesn't matter. None of those decisions will affect the, uh, the value of the firm. So if value of the firm doesn't change based on the capital structure, what let's uh, go one step further. We're gonna move to proposition two. So the value of the unlevered firm will be this, right? Cash flows over one plus WAC. For the levered firm, it's going to be the same, cash flows. Remember our assumptions, cash flows were the same for those firms. But for the levered firm, we are using WAC-L. So if these two things are same, when cash flows are same, what do you see here? What do you see here for WACs? They should be same. WAC should be the same, exactly. So Modigliani Miller, Proposition 2, says what? It says, the firm's cost of capital is unaffected by capital structure. So you cannot minimize WAC by um, changing your capital structure. Are you tired? Are you doing okay? Okay, I'm going very slowly, I know, but I think this is good for now because I'm gonna show you something very ugly now. <laughs> okay, ready? <laughs> yes. Okay. So we said weighted average cost of capital is same. It is irrelevant of uh, capital structure. Now let's focus on cost of equity. Okay. So cost of assets or return on assets, David. Okay. Is weighted average of return on debt and equity. Same with WAC idea. So this is weight of debt, cost of debt. Remember, there are no taxes. That's why we don't have min one minus t here. Plus cost, uh, weight of equity, cost of equity. So together, they're going to give you the uh, cost of assets or return on assets, which is equal to WAC of an unlevered firm by definition. Here, some magic happens. OK, simple things. And you come up with this. So cost of equity is equal to, or return on equity is equal to return on assets, which is basically the risk of a company or return on a company if the company doesn't have any leverage. Plus, you're introducing some additional risks due to leverage. So as you can see from here, if this part is positive, return on assets minus return on debt is positive, Increasing debt will increase cost of equity. So now we are moving into something like this. And try to be awake for a while because this part gets confusing for some students, okay? Just wake up, wake up, okay? So cost of equity is increasing in debt and I'm gonna show you where it comes from with betas and kephams and stuff, okay? But cost of equity increases as you increase debt. Cost of debt is fixed. It doesn't change with, with uh, debt. And it is lower than cost of equity. And weighted average co cost of capital is going to be fixed. The idea is same. Remember, we said weighted average cost of capital doesn't change when you change the debt to equity ratio. So it should be a straight line. But my question to you, I mean, the answer is written here, but I want you to give me an answer understanding this. 
if cost of equity is increasing in debt, how come weighted average cost of capital stays constant as you increase debt? I mean, this is fixed, this is increasing. When you take the average of those costs, it's a flat line. Why? Let's wait like five more seconds for someone new. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five. Because as we're increasing debt, we're increasing the debt to equity ratio, so the weights of the costs are changing. So the weighted average stays. That, that's exactly one thing. Remember, weighted average cost of capital is what? Weight of equity times cost of equity plus, do you want me to write it? Okay, this is, of course, no tax case. Weight of equity times cost of equity plus weight of debt, cost of debt. So as you increase, as you use more debt, what happens? You're increasing weight of debt. You're decreasing weight of equity. But you know that cost of debt is less than cost of equity. So just, just stay with me, like one sentence, you can get it. When you increase debt, cost of equity will increase, but at the same time, you're using more of the cheaper financing source. So they're gonna offset each other, and weighted average cost of capital will be the same. This is what this note says. Was it clear? I want someone else to try to explain it to me back. Who wants to explain it? This time I'm gonna wait till eight. Let's go step by step together, okay? So you start with the first sentence and then I will continue. It's very important. So you're increasing that. So what happens to the weight? What happens to the weight of that when you increase that? Okay, and it, <laughs> it increases, right? You use more debt, so weight of debt will increase. Okay, weight of equity will decrease, right? Because it's slicing the pie. If you cut the slice bigger for debt, the slice for equity will be smaller. You're going very well, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and then, is there anyone who wants to step in? So when you use more debt, what happens to cost of equity? If you increase debt, what happens to cost of equity? It's going to increase, exactly. But as you're using more debt, which one is cheaper, debt or equity? Debt. Debt is cheaper, so you're using more of the cheaper uh, financing source. So those two effects will offset each other. I think it was perfect, Olga. Very, very well. Okay, he is right. Did you get what I just said? Okay, perfect. Um, and I thought you were gonna ask me why cost of debt is smaller than cost of equity, so I put the slide, which was from the previous slides. Uh, it's not in the, in the slides you, you, you printed. Um, so we, we already know that cost of stock is very high. This is cost of IPOs. Then we have cost of uh, seasoned equity offering, which is also equity, cost of equity. Then we have convertible uh, bonds, which is form of uh, debt. And then we have normal bonds. So cost of equity is always higher than cost of debt. So nobody asked this, but it's there if you're interested or you already remember it. Okay. Uh, I. I thought this part wasn't going to be very clear, so I put this mathematical example. It's going to show you the same thing. Changing debt to equity ratio is not going to change WEC. So this example shows that thing, just in mathematical uh, in numbers. So I use different debt and equity numbers here. I have 1,000 equity, zero debt, 800 equity, 200 debt, 500, 500, 100, and 900. So I have $1,000 worth of assets. I'm just slicing it differently. So in each case, you can calculate weight of equity and weight of debt. Let's just do this for this part. So if I have 800 
dollar worth of equity and two hundred dollar of debt. What is my weight of equity? How do I calculate this? It's eight hundred over two hundred. One thousand. Thank you. Okay, so it should be equity over assets. Do you want me to write it as V or A? It doesn't matter. Okay, so it's going to be 0 0.8, and weight of debt will be equal to 200 over 1,000, which is the remaining part. So together, it should be equal to 1. Okay, so in each case, uh, I have different cost of equities and ki kind of different cost of debts. Okay, so when you calculate WEC, uh, this is weight of equity times return on equity, weight of debt times return on debt. So if you do that, you're going to calculate the WEX. In each, in each case, uh, WEX will be equal to 15%. So if you're interested in where this intuition comes from in numbers, this is an example you can find in, in your slides. So basically, we said cost of equity is increasing in debt when we have no bankruptcy and no, no taxes. Okay, And the rate of increase depends on this difference. Okay, and if a company doesn't have any debt, this is going to be equal to zero, and cost of equity will be equal to cost of assets because there's no debt. All the cost or return should come from equity. Very straightforward, right? Okay. Um, now I want it to. I want to link it to um, some risk, but I want to take a break. And then we can continue. Let's take a 10 minute break. And don't be late. <laughs> 